Hi guys, today we're gonna to talk a little bit about this anvil. This is gonna be pretty cool. This is a hay button anvil built in Brooklyn, New York around the late 1920s. We're gonna to try to explore a little more about its history, find out a little more about it, talk a little bit more about anvil history, and clean this one up. We're gonna show you why we clean them up and not restore them, but I wanna sort of showcase its story. Every anvil has a story, and I feel like everyone has an anvil story to tell. So I wanna hear from you. Tell me in the comments section below about your favorite anvil story. Tell me about that one your grandfather had or that one that got away or how you're looking for an anvil and you know, how's that going for you? We all wanna hear about your anvil story. Obviously, if you've watched this far, we're into anvils. So type it out below. Let's dive deeper into this one. It's in pretty good shape, guys. It's pretty flat. It's got a little bit of sway in the middle, but honestly, real, real nice. We're not gonna worry about that. Maybe we'll just clean it up a little bit with a flap wheel on the top. We're not gonna go after this pit. It's totally superficial. It doesn't matter. We'll maybe flap or wheel the horn a little bit, just on the top, giving us a nice surface to work on. This is a really nice solid anvil. Then we're gonna go through and wire brush or wire wheel all the letters being real gentle where the stampings are so we don't remove anything. Then we'll paint them in to highlight them so that we can really show off the original stampings of this. Hopefully we can find a good serial number here and get a little more of its history, tell you a little bit more about it. We're gonna start with a braided bristle brush. This is very aggressive, so we don't wanna use this around the stampings. So now we're gonna switch to a knotted cup brush. This will allow us to get into some areas that we couldn't get into before. So again, we are using a knotted wheel on a variable speed angle grinder. That is critical. The fact that we can change the speed allows this to last a lot longer and be less aggressive. Okay, now we're gonna clean out the letters using a brush. So here's where we're at. We've cleaned it all up with the wire brushes. I honestly, I don't think I'm gonna even flap or wheel this top. It's very flat, it's in good shape. It doesn't need to be shiny to be useful. We've got some chisel marks down here, but that's totally typical. There's really not a lot of wear on, on the plate here. This is where you do chiseling. That, you know, I don't want to say it's factory, but that could have been there forever. That's probably a torch from someone torch cutting, but it's not through, it's not very deep. Um, it's in nice shape. Here's our stamping. So far we can pretty definitively say AY button. I think we're missing the H. We've got probably about half of the word manufacturing and company is pretty clear. And then Brooklyn, New York, we're missing most of Brooklyn. We see some of New York. And then it should say 150 down here if it's 150 pound. I haven't weighed it yet, but I think there's kind of a zero. Otherwise, over here, we have the serial number and we'll clean this up some more and look it up. And then up here we have an inspector stamp. Hey Button was real famous for doing this. Uh, this is a seven, this can be one through nine, and this would have been a, an inspector stamp. Also, see this, see this, it looks like delamination, but you gotta remember, this is a late model hay button, so a couple of cool things going on here. This is actually solid steel, including the horn, up to the waist of this. This is a two-piece construction. A lot of the earlier anvils were a three-piece construction, where they'd only have about a half-inch thick steel plate right here, and then this would all be wrought iron. Well. That's because steel was very expensive back in the day. So once it got a little cheaper, this was about 1920s era, they would have made this whole section out of steel. So from the tip to the tail, from the waist up, this is one solid piece of steel. And this is forged, not cast. So they would have held this in a forge under a power hammer and some sledgehammers and gotten into its vague shape. Then they would have taken this, which was a bundled wrought iron from the waist down, forged it to shape and to do that they would put these handling holes in and there's going to be one on the bottom too so they would have added that first so that they could shove a rod in there to manipulate this over the anvil while forging it then they would have gotten this whole base to stupid stupid hot i mean blatantly ridiculous hot 
and this whole top same way in a coal forge. And then they would have sh thrown this on top of that over a giant anvil, slapped it with a hammer a few times, forming a eutectic bond between the steel top portion and the wrought iron bottom portion. And that's what we're seeing right here. It honestly didn't matter how aesthetic it was. It's certainly a solid bond. So you can see on these late model hay buttons, you can kind of see the forge weld throughout. This is another handling hole in the back. What's interesting to me is that this handling hole is significantly smaller than the one on the other side. I don't think it goes all the way through. It shouldn't, but it's full of crap. I'm gonna dig it out and we'll see. Again, there's kind of our forge weld spot. Here we have a hardy hole and a pritchell hole. They're in real nice shape. Again, this top is so nice. I love it. But if we look over here, this is one of my favorite features. This is only seen on late model hay buttons. This is the number 12. This is believed to be the steel batch number. So at some point in hay buttons history, they were having some issues with some steel suppliers. So they would do an entire batch of anvils out of a single supply of steel and they would mark it there. So if they all went bad, they could warranty it or whatever accordingly. So that again tells me this is a very late model hay button. See our forge weld there. It's in real nice shape, man. This is a, this is a truly beautiful anvil. That is really its only, that's what's making it not a 10. Oh, I love it. So we've got it all wire wheeled. Now we're going to do a little more cleanup on it. We're just spraying it down with some concentrated simple green to get the rest of the rust off. Just taking a paper towel, blue towel, and just trying to get all of our loose rust off. Just trying to get it basically clean. Just clean it up. I'm washing it. Look at that, that's nasty. A lot of that's just from the wire brushing process. We just loosened a lot of it up. And the simple green will actually remove rust. So if we keep it wet long enough, it'll do a really nice job. It's pretty impressive. So we've sprayed it down with simple green. Now we're just gonna take a scotch Brite pad. We're just trying to get more of that loose, loose rust off. And then wipe it off. Our goal here, to get all that off. I'm gonna use a little bit of this Sam Rust Mort to get the last of the spaces. Just taking an acid brush and brushing it on. Let that sit a little bit. It'll be perfect. Make sure you're doing this in a well ventilated area with an acid respirator on. Converting things, almost done. It's looking pretty good. I think it looks pretty badass. Okay, so the rust converter did its thing, dissolving all the rust, leaving us with a nice black color. And now we're just washing it off. First we did water, now we're doing some more simple green. Just making sure we get in every nook and cranny, you wanna get all that rust converter off or it's gonna flash rust on you. So this is what it looks like after the rust converter. It gives it kind of a nice uniform, dark, blackish. It doesn't look good in this light, but it also really gets in all those nooks and crannies. And see, like this one, we couldn't see at all before. And I think that five's even gonna be apparent. And this zero looks like an eight. So that does a real nice job. Yeah, we still have a little bit down here. If I had a big enough tub, I would dip the whole thing in rust converter. I don't, so. We did three coats, let it sit a while, then neutralized it. That's good enough for our purposes. Now we're gonna coat it in some oil. We're just gonna use WD-40 for now because I'm gonna rub most of that off and change some things up later. So let's coat it in WD-40. WD-40 does a real good job of just protecting it from, from rust. It'll probably need a thicker oil later, but this will prevent any flash rust, displace any water that still remains from rinsing off the rust converter. And, uh, gives it some protection until we get to doing our next processes. Look at that. Nice. I like to go kind of heavy on it. After coating it with WD-40, which should prevent any flash rusting, I think it looks pretty good. We can start to see A button manufacturing, Brooklyn, New York. One, five, probably eight, maybe. And then down here, our serial number is looking pretty darn crisp. Looking forward to looking at that in a little bit. Looking good, looking good.
Looking over the serial number, we definitely have a something, 51734. That something, on the other hand, is interesting because it looks kind of like there's a center line here, which would make it either an eight, a three, probably not a four, because it looks like this comes up and goes that way, or it's a letter. That is the mystery, but we definitely have something, five, one, seven, three, four. Looking things over here in Anvils in America from Richard Postman, we have a list of serial numbers. Now, if it's just nothing, 51734, referencing that here, it comes up as the year 1900, but that would be a two-piece or three-piece anvil, not a two-piece. Looking here at 151734, it would be 1908. Still a three-piece, not a two-piece anvil. The only other option is that that's an A51734 making it 1923. This would be a two-piece anvil, a late style, so this makes some sense, but who's to say how correct this is? So so I'm just painting in these letters, and it can be a little bit rough because I'm gonna rub off all the high points. But we're just trying to accent what is there. We're not trying to add anything in. The reason I don't just put paint over the whole thing is because when I then rub off the high points, we're gonna end up with paint in all these little low spots. So this makes it a little bit cleaner. Looking good, looking good. That's the second coat, and then I will rub off all the high spots so we're just showing what the lows are. I always use this paint, King's Gold. Just cheap old paint from the local store. And yeah, we've got some pretty good crystal clear stampings on here. I'm excited. Okay, so we've got our second coat on. Now it's time to clean it up. Just a red scotch bright. I'm just going lightly in all the different directions, so I'm removing all the high spots. That looks great. So no embellishments, this is just what's actually there. We've only filled in the low spots, we've removed anything that we kind of guessed at, and that's, that's what our actual stampings read. Same thing, we've got two coats of paint in here, we've let it dry, now we're just going to remove all the high spots, and it's gonna reveal what's What's really there? So this is starting to look more and more like it's 151734, which makes this 1908. 1908 is a very interesting transition year, and we have to figure out, is this a 1908 animal? So, a couple things. It has handling holes in the front and back. It also has a handling hole on the bottom, as well as this concave bottom. You gotta remember, it is also, where I'm sure as heck seems to be, a two-piece design, forge welded at the waist. There's no evidence at all of a steel plate up here, and it has these late model, model markings here. So, let's do a little more research. I don't know what it is. Most of the early hay button anvils have three handling holes, one in the bottom and one on either end of the waist under the horn and the heel. The one under the heel usually tends to be smaller than the other two. That makes sense. That's exactly what we have going on. Most of the hay button anvils made before 1909 have a number stamped in the front of the waist under the horn to the left or the right of the handling hole. We have that. That's a number seven. This number is sometimes stamped on both sides, yada, 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 zero to nine, usually quite deep. So that makes sense for ours as well. That would put it as before 1909. The third and major style change came at about 1908, when the method of making the top half of the anvil was completely changed. Instead of welding tool steel face plate onto a wrought iron body, the entire anvil from the waist up was made of a single piece of open hearth tool steel. That's what we've got. That's definitely the style we have. This is 1919 versus an early three-piece one. See how the sweeping curve of the back here? This is definitely our style. What's interesting is that 
we have a transition here, it looks like. So the patent for the two-piece construction was only filed in 1908, late in 1908, which means this has to be one of the first two-piece anvils. That's kind of cool. So looking at this, this is the actual patent for the two-piece anvil construction, and it wasn't actually approved until May 25th of 1909, which means our anvil was made in that transitional period during the patent pending stage. They would have been producing them, but they didn't actually have secured the patent yet. That's pretty cool. Plateless anvils had, in addition, numbers stamped on the opposite side of the body, the trademark and weight. Now we have that, but I assumed that meant late model ones. It, I guess, doesn't. Even from the beginning, the onset of the two-piece model, they were putting that extra stamping on there. Now here's another cool thing. Here's another interesting thing. I have found the letters BB stamped to the right of the serial number, and I've found numbers of one digit stamped under the horn. I have no explanation for them. I think we have that. See what I see? That's a number eight stamped under the horn. So even Postman had no idea why this was here. I didn't even notice it until I started looking for it. That's kind of cool. The base of those anvils manufactured after 1908 appear to be made of one piece of wrought iron or low carbon steel. Ours seems to be wrought iron. The underside of the base is hollowed out as much as two inches deep in the center. That fully accounts for ours. Now, what's interesting is that it says those after 1908, again, we're at a transition year, 1908, but check this out. Uh, after 1908, most hay and anvils had only two handling holes, one under the base and one under the horn in the waist. So that means basically 1909 on, they would have had one less handling hole. That also confirms that we have a 1908 and a crazy transition year. That's pretty cool. Well, I painted in that number too because now we know it's there. So we weighed it in at 149.8 pounds. That makes a lot of sense for the 153. Yeah, it's lost a little weight from the bottom and rust and stuff, but really, that's a beautiful anvil. It's way easier to ruin an anvil through restoration and repair than it is to improve upon it. Things like this little chip on this corner, a lot of people would weld that in and grind it flush. When you weld on an anvil, you are changing the heat treatment at that spot. That can affect the rebound, that can affect the overall performance, that's not a good thing. There are correct ways of doing that, but there are far more incorrect ways of doing that. Generally speaking, I just like to clean them up like this. Even here, we're only accentuating what's there. We're not actually putting in or manipulating the stampings. We're not adding in the H because the H isn't there. Check we it out. Oh man, it turned out so awesome. We did all the research together and all the cleanup together and that was so much fun. Now we know that this is an exciting 1908 transition year hay button anvil. Oh, it's such a beautiful piece too. It's seriously an amazing condition for being over 100 years old. Such a cool piece of American manufacturing. Wow. So cool. I hope you enjoyed this process. Comment below with your crazy anvil story that you grew up with or that one that got away because I really do want to hear it. As you can tell, anvils get me excited. Hopefully you learned a little bit about this, this particular piece and manu manufacturing of anvils in general. Heck, hey button, they made some cool ones. Thanks for tuning in. Make sure you subscribe. All of that assorted crap that I'm going to waste your time by mentioning. Have a great day.